October 1st. Of all the tests by which the good citizen and strong reformer can be distinguished from the vague faddist or the inhuman skeptic, I know no better test than this, that the unreal reformer sees in front of him one certain future, the future of his fad, while the real reformer sees before him ten or twenty futures, among which his country must choose, and may in some dreadful hour choose the wrong one. The true patriot is always doubtful of victory, because he knows that he is dealing with a living thing, a thing with free will. To be certain of free will is to be uncertain of success. Introduction to American Notes October 2nd Nietzsche scales staggering mountains, but he turns up ultimately in Tibet. He sits down beside Tolstoy in the land of nothing and nirvana. They are both helpless, one because he must not grasp anything, and the other because he must not let go of anything. The Tolstoyian will is frozen by a Buddhist instinct that all special actions are evil, but the Nietzscheite's will is quite equally frozen by his view that all special actions are good. For if all special actions are good, none of them are special. They stand at the crossroads, and one hates all the roads, and the other likes all the roads. The result is, well, some things are not hard to calculate. They stand at the crossroads. Orthodoxy. October 3rd. Modern women defend their office with all the fierceness of domesticity. They fight for desk and typewriter as for hearth and home, and develop a sort of wolfish wifehood on behalf of the invisible head of the firm. That is why they do office work so well, and that is why they ought not to do it. What's wrong with the world? October 4th. St. Francis of Assisi. For most people there is a fascinating inconsistency in the position of St. Francis. He expressed in loftier and bolder language than any earthly thinker the conception that laughter is as divine as tears. He called his monks the mountebanks of God. He never forgot to take pleasure in a bird as it flashed past him, or a drop of water as it fell from his finger. He was perhaps the happiest of the sons of men. Yet this man undoubtedly founded his whole polity on the negation of what we think of the most imperious necessities. In his three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, he denied to himself and those he loved most property, love, and liberty. Why was it that the most large-hearted and poetic spirits in that age found their most congenial atmosphere in these awful renunciations? Why did he who loved where all men were blind seek to blind himself where all men loved? Why was he a monk and not a troubadour? We have a suspicion that if these questions were answered, we should suddenly find that much of the enigma of this sullen time of ours was answered also. Twelve Types It is awful to think that this world, which so many poets have praised, has even for a time been depicted as a man-trap into which we may just have the manhood to jump. Think of all those ages through which men have had the courage to die, and then remember that we have actually fallen to talking about having the courage to live. George Bernard Shaw October 6th We will eat and drink later. Let us remain together a little, we who have loved each other so sadly and have fought so long. I seem to remember only centuries of heroic war, in which you were always heroes, epic on epic, Iliad on Iliad, and you always brothers in arms. Whether it was but recently, for time is nothing, or at the beginning of the world, I sent you out to war. I sat in the darkness where there is not any created thing, and to you I was only a voice commanding valor and an unnatural virtue. You heard the voice in the dark, and you never heard it again. The sun in heaven denied it, the earth and sky denied it, all human wisdom denied it. And when I met you in the daylight, I denied it myself. But you were men. You did not forget your secret honor, though the whole cosmos turned an engine of torture to tear it out of you. The Man Who Was Thursday October 7th The truest kinship with humanity would lie in doing as humanity has always done, accepting with a sportsmanlike relish the estate to which we are called, 
the star of our happiness, and the fortunes of the land of our birth. Twelve Types October 8th When your father told you, walking about the garden, that bees stung or that roses smell sweet, you did not talk of taking the best out of his philosophy. When the bees stung you, you did not call it an entertaining coincidence. When the rose smelt sweet, you did not say, My father is a rude barbaric symbol enshrining, perhaps unconsciously, the deep delicate truth that flowers smell. No, you believed your father because you had found him to be a living fountain of facts, a thing that really knew more than you, a thing that would tell you the truth tomorrow as well as today. Orthodoxy October 9th there is only one thing that it requires real courage to say, and that is a truism. G. F. Waits October 10th Red is the most joyful and dreadful thing in the physical universe. It is the fiercest note. It is the highest light. It is the place where the walls of this world of ours, where thinnest and something beyond burns through. It glows in the blood which sustains and in the fire which destroys us in the roses of our romance, and in the awful cup of our religion. It stands for all passionate happiness, as in faith or in first love. Daily News October 11th Commonness means the quality common to the saint and the sinner, to the philosopher and the fool, and it was this that Dickens grasped and developed. In everybody there is a certain thing that loves babies, that fears death that likes sunlight. That thing enjoys Dickens. And everybody does not mean uneducated crowds. Everybody means everybody. Everybody means Mrs. Maynell. Charles Dickens. October 12th. Some of the most frantic lies on the face of life are told with modesty and restraint, for the simple reason that only modesty and restraint will save them. Charles Dickens. October 13th. In a world without humor, the only thing to do is to eat. And how perfect an exception! How can these people strike dignified attitudes and pretend that things matter, when the total ludicrousness of life is proved by the very method by which it is supported? A man strikes the liar and says, Life is real, life is earnest, and then goes into a room and stuffs alien substances into a hole in his head. The Napoleon of Notting Hill October 14th, Battle of Hastings. Gored on the Norman Gonfalon, the golden dragon died. We should not wake with ballad strings, the good time of the smaller things. We shall not see the holy kings ride down the Severn side. Ballad of Alfred. October 15th, I am a grown-up and I do not worry myself much about Zola's immorality. The thing I cannot stand is his morality. If ever a man on this earth lived to embody the tremendous text, but if the light in your body be darkness, how great is the darkness? It was certain he, great men like Ariosto, Rabelais, and Shakespeare, fall in foul places, flounder in violent but venial sin, sprawl for pages, exposing their gigantic weakness, are dirty, are indefensible, and then they struggle up again and can still speak with a convincing kindness and an unbroken honor of the best things in the world. Rabelais of the instruction of ardent and austere youth, Ariosto of holy chivalry, Shakespeare of the splendid stillness of mercy. But in Zola, even the ideals are undesirable. Zola's mercy is colder than justice. Nay, Zola's mercy is more bitter in the mouth than injustice. When Zola shows us an ideal training, he does not take us, like Rabelais, into the holy field of humanist learning. He takes us into the schools of inhumanist learning, where there are neither books nor flowers, nor wine nor wisdom, but only deformities in glass bottles, and where the rule is taught from the exceptions. Zola's truth answers the exact description of the skeleton in the cupboard. That is, it is something of which a domestic custom forbids the discovery, but which is quite dead even when it is discovered. All Things Considered October 16th We talk in a cant phrase of the man in the street, but the Frenchman is the man in the street, 
as the Frenchman drinks in the street and dines in the street. So he fights in the street and dies in the street, so that the street can never be commonplace to him. Tremendous Trifles October 17th If we wish to preserve the family, we must revolutionize the nation. What's wrong with the world? October 18th St. Luke's Day In these days we are accustomed of attacking science because we want it to be scientific. Surely there is not any undue disrespect to our doctor in saying that he is our doctor, not our priest or our wife or ourself. It is not the business of the doctor to say that we must go to a watering place. It is his affair to say that certain results of health will follow if we do go to a watering place. After that, obviously, it is for us to judge. Physical science is simple addition. It is either infallible or it is false. To mix science up with philosophy is only to produce a philosophy that has lost all its ideal value and a science that has lost all its practical value. I want my private physician to tell me whether this or that food will kill me. It is for my private philosopher to tell me whether I ought to be killed. All things considered. October 19th. It was absurd to say that Waterloo was won on Eton cricket fields. But it might have been fairly said that Waterloo was won on a village green, where clumsy boys played a very clumsy cricket. In a word, it was the average of the nation that was strong, and athletic glories do not indicate much about the average of a nation. Waterloo was not won by good cricket players, but Waterloo was won by bad cricket players, by a mass of men who had some minimum of athletic instincts and habits. It is a good sign in a nation. When such things are done badly, it shows that all the people are doing them, and it is a bad sign in a nation when such things are done very well, for it shows that only a few experts and eccentrics are doing them, and that the nation is merely looking on, all things considered. October 20th. I sometimes think it is a pity that people travel in foreign countries. It narrows their minds so much. Daily News. October 21st, Trafalgar Day. The heroic is a fact, even when it is a fact of coincidence or of miracle. And a fact is a thing which can be admitted without being explained. But I would merely hint that there is a very natural explanation of this frightful felicity, either a phrase or action, which so many men have exhibited on so many scaffolds or battlefields. It is merely that when a man has found something which he prefers to life, he then for the first time begins to live. A promptitude of poetry opens in his soul of which our paltry experiences do not possess the key. When once he has despised this world as a mere instrument, it becomes a musical instrument. It falls into certain artistic harmonies around him. If Nelson had not worn his stars, he would not have been hit. But if he had not worn his stars, he would not have been Nelson. And if he had not been Nelson, he might have lost the battle. Daily News October 22nd Watts proved no doubt that he was not wholly without humor by his admirable pitcher, the first oyster. Gladstone proved that he was not wholly without humor by his reply to Mr. Chaplin, by his singing of Duda, and by his support of a grant to the Duke of Coburg. But both men were singularly little possessed by the mood or the idea of humor. To them had been in peculiar fullness revealed the one great truth which our modern thought does not know, and which it may possibly perish through not knowing. They knew that to enjoy life means to take it seriously. There is an eternal kinship between solemnity and high spirits, and almost the very name of it is Gladstone. Its other name is Watts. They knew that not only life but every detail of life is most a pleasure when it is studied with the gloomiest intensity. The startling cheerfulness of the old age of Watts are both redolent of this exuberant seriousness, this uproarious gravity. They were as happy as the birds because like the birds they were untainted by the disease of laughter. They are as awful and philosophical as children at play. Indeed, they remind us of a truth true for all of us, though capable of misunderstanding, that the great aim of a man's life 
is to get into his second childhood. Watts. October 23rd. The foil may curve in the lunge, but there is nothing beautiful about beginning the battle with a crooked foil. So the strict aim, the strong doctrine, may give a little in the actual fight with facts, but that is no reason for beginning with a weak doctrine or a twisted aim. Do not be an opportunist. Try to be theoretic at all the opportunities. Fate can be trusted to do all the opportunist part of it. Do not try to bend. Any more than the trees try to bend. Try to grow straight, and life will bend you. Daily News October 24th Truth must necessarily be stranger than fiction, for fiction is the creation of the human mind, and therefore congenial to it. The Club of Queer Trades October 25th If a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. What's wrong with the world? October 26th It is currently said that hope goes with youth and lends to youth its wings of a butterfly. But I fancy that hope is the last gift given to man and the only gift not given to youth. Youth is preeminently the period in which a man can be lyric, fanatical, poetic. But youth is the period in which a man can be hopeless. The end of every episode is the end of the world. But the power of hoping through everything, the knowledge that the soul survives its adventures, that great inspiration comes to the middle-aged, God has kept that good wine until now. Charles Dickens October 27th We have made an empire out of our refuse, but we cannot make a nation even out of our best material. Such is the vague and half-conscious contradiction that undoubtedly possesses the minds of great masses of the not unkindly rich. Touching the remote empire, they feel a vague but vast humanitarian hope. Touching the chances of small holdings or rural reconstruction in the heart of the empire, they feel a doubt and a disinclination that is not untouched with despair. Their creed contains two great articles. First, that the common Englishman can get on anywhere and second, that the common Englishman cannot get on in England. Introduction to Cottage Homes of England October 28th There is only one very timid sort of man that is not afraid of women. What's wrong with the world? October 29th I do not see ghosts. I only see their inherent probability. Tremendous trifles. October 30th do you see this lantern? Do you see the cross carved on it and the flame inside? You did not make it. You did not light it. Better men than you, men who could believe and obey, twisted the entrails of iron and preserved the legend of fire. There is not a street you walk on, there is not a thread you wear, that was not made as this lantern was, by denying your philosophy of dirt and rats. You can make nothing. You can only destroy you will destroy mankind. You will destroy the world. Let that suffice you. Yet this one old Christian lantern you shall now destroy. It shall go where your empire of apes will never have the wit to find it. The Man Who Was Thursday October 31st, Halloween If we ever get the English back on to the English land, they will become again a religious people. If all goes well, a superstitious people. The absence from modern life of both the higher and the lower forms of faith is largely due to a divorce from nature and the trees and clouds. If we have no more turnip ghosts, it is chiefly from the lack of turnips. Heretics.